what, what I want to do, and I'm going to write it in a few different forms. We're going to start with it like this. Um, and I'm going to switch back and forth at different times between time and space. That doesn't really matter. But this equation is so central to physics, and some of the techniques we use are so central to techniques we use other places, but it can all be done analytically here, that it's a powerful example equation. So we're going to do about three or four things with this, perhaps, in little pieces. The first one I want to do is really focus on a formal solution using, you know, linear operator language. So we'll talk about the linear operator D, which we define as D by DX in this case. So if we do that, how might you write this equation? Take just 30 seconds, rewrite this equation in terms of some expression involving D times Y equal to zero. So just take 30 seconds to do that yourself. Always helpful to engage the brain early in the morning. Anyone want to tell me what they got? Perfect. Now, what can we do to this nice abstract expression here? D is an operator, but now mathematically, what can we do? We could find eigenvalues and eigenvectors, which is sort of what we're going to do. But what is a way I can rewrite it? We can factor it. This will factor into d minus some constant times d minus some other constant. Notice, in this case, normally with operators, and we're going to come back to this, we have to worry about what? Whether they commute, right? Operators don't always commute. Now, in this case, our only operators around are taking derivatives and multiplying by a constant. And this is the same operator. An operator always commutes with itself. And numbers always commute with operators. So if I, because if I write this back, if I go the other way, this is d squared minus a times d minus D times B plus AB. This may or may not simplify nicely like we're used to if these were also, say, operators, right? Because A times D and D times B could be different things. So you have to be a little careful because one of the main places this is used, this type of idea, is in quantum mechanics when you do the harmonic oscillator. Because you have an operator involving P, which is minus I h bar d by dx, and you have an operator x, and those do not commute. So when you factor, you have to worry about the order of operation. So this is just a little heads up. One of the reasons I do this example is you're going to do something very similar in quantum mechanics, but right now we're going to do it with them commuting. When you do it, you're going to have to worry about them not commuting. And so it gives you a slightly different answer, gives you some other stuff. And you get the coolest thing in physics called the raising and lowering operators. So it's something to be excited about for next year. See, we like to keep in the edge of the seats. It's always important to have some you know, foreshadowing of things to come. But having factored this case and knowing they commute, we're going to use um, later. But what are A and B in this case? Anybody really fast with their quadratic formula? The constants A and B are the two solutions. <laughs> 
Look at that. I mentioned the word quadratic formula and we all freeze up. Minus A1. Perfect. We, we jogged the memory there. Now, one thing to notice, they are either two real numbers or they're two complex conjugates of each other. Right? The solutions don't have to be real. The controlling factor in all of this is whether or not a1 squared minus 4a2 a0 is greater than or less than 0. That controls a lot of the behavior. Of course, if a1 equals 0, then what do we have? Um, what type of number? Imaginary. Purely imaginary. <coughs> now, I'm doing all of this, of course, under the assumption that my coefficients are positive. Right? If a2 and a0 Happen, one of them happens to be negative and one happens to be positive, we're in trouble. Well, it changes the behavior. But in general, A2, A0 for physical situations will be positive. Now, if I look back up, A1 equals 0, notice gets rid of this term and I have my harmonic oscillator equation and we'll see that the roots better be imaginary. That's what gives me oscillatory solutions because now, Looking at this formally, since I said everything commutes, then the nice thing is either that equals zero or that equals zero because I can do the operator in either way. I wrote it as d minus a times d minus by, so clearly if d minus by is zero, the whole thing is zero because once I get zero, anything times zero is zero. Um, it's not so clear that this is a solution unless they commute. Because if they don't commute, I always have to do this first. And then it might change things. But since they commute, I can put this in front and if this is zero, again, I get zero. So that's very handy. And that immediately tells me, because now, and this is what will happen, for instance, when you're doing quantum mechanics. You'll do it in operator language until the very last step and then you'll turn it back into a derivative. This is telling me dy dx equals ay, and this is telling me dy dx equals by. So my two solutions are y1 equals c1 e to the ax, and y2 equals c2 e to the bx. Notice how many constants of integration did I get? Total for my problem, I got two, one for each. Notice the other thing I did. By factoring, I turned a second order differential equation into what? How many of them? Two first order. It's a common idea in physics is to take your second order differential equation and to turn them into two first order differential equations. One way you might do that is the trivial way, so this is a little bit of a side. If you have a d squared x dt squared equals stuff, write it as dv dt and then have x equals, I'm sorry, dx dt equals v and now you'll have two first order equations. And believe it or not, sometimes doing that actually simplifies the problem and makes it easier to solve. So we have our two solutions. Now we see if a and b are purely imaginary, these are e to the i omega solutions. And so I have oscillatory solutions, which I expected. But in general, the solution to this equation is y equals c1 e to the ax plus c2 e to the bx. And all of the behavior is governed by what we call the characteristic equation or this right here. What does a and b become? There's one other case to quickly mention, and that's the case of a double root where we end up with that. And this is one of those things we get very used to in our physics. Um, 
a particular set of solutions like exponential or sinusoidal and then every now and then you get a situation where it's just a little bit odd and it's unclear what to do and you panic. What would you talk to your neighbor and guess what you would guess for the solution to this equation? So chat with someone. If, you, if I told you what is the solution to this? Remember, you're going to need two constants of integration. So just kind of take a guess what you might get. Anyone got a guess? Yes? Uh, one of the solutions would be multiplied by AX. Okay, why are you guessing, say, x e to the AX? Uh, Perfect. I love that. That's a great physicist answer. Why else might you guess that? Guess other than e to the AX? Right, so you can e to the AX is clearly going to work, right? Yeah. Because I get 1 d minus a times e to the AX, that's 0, then I've got 0 and I'm done. Is, is a simple, is just x by itself likely to work? No, why not? I've got these a's that I'm multiplying it by, right? These constant, I'm going to get a constant a times x, right? If I expand this out, I've got the a squared term, and a squared times x is just going to be a squared times x, and there's going to be nothing in the derivatives to really cancel it out. But why would something with a single x likely to work out okay for us? What happens to x when I differentiate twice? It goes away. So it's likely this is going to stay around and do nice stuff to get canceled, and this will go away. So let's see if that really does work. And the really the relevant piece is doing the d minus a on x e to the ax first. Well, that's going to be an e to the ax, the derivative on the x, plus an x e to the ax minus, whoops, I'm sorry, with an a in front. That's taking the derivative of the e, this is d acting on the e to the ax piece. And then a times that is ax e to the ax. So notice those two go away. So when I act with my first d minus a on my y, I'm left with e to the ax. So now when I come through with my second d minus a, what do I get? What is d minus a? acting on e to the ax? It, it's, it's zero, right? That's exactly, remember, I'm trying to get you to think operator-wise now, right? This operator acting on that is zero. That's what it meant for e to the ax to be a solution of d minus a y equals zero. So d minus a acting on this gives me e to the ax because these two pieces cancel out. So notice this I get from actually doing the derivatives. I remember that my operator d is d by dx. And then this, I don't actually have to take any derivatives. I just know that this is a solution. In a sense, it's an eigenvector of d. Right? This is the eigenvalue equation. And so that's another way to just see it without actually taking the derivatives. Of course, I could take the derivatives and it would work. Notice. We can see right away that if I have two different roots, this will not equal zero. Because the first d minus a will give me that up there, and then d minus b on e to the ax is not zero, because b doesn't match a. So this is not a solution for the non-double root case. And so it's only a special solution with double roots. And it's, we, it's important to highlight because from a physics point of view, the x piece can be a problem. Because it could represent unbounded growth in a situation where physically something must cut it off. And one of the things that's important from a physics point of view when you look at solutions of differential equations is to ask yourself where do they become unphysical because that indicates where your model will break down. 
So if you've approximated something as a harmonic oscillator and you've received a double root and you see this, this could be like the short-term behavior. You might have a transient that's linear, but ultimately it's got to go away. So something's got to change in your model to make it go away. Now, if this has a decay in it, that could be enough to do it. It might be this decays fast enough to kill your x. But if this is purely oscillatory and you have an x here, you're going to be in trouble. Make sense? Now, the last piece, which I'm going to leave as a little bit of an exercise for you, and it'll be an exercise that shows up in the group problems. It's really important to go through things like what I mentioned. A1 equals zero, then we're always purely imaginary. And that means oscillations. A1 not equal to zero, notice we always have a piece e to the minus a1t. So if a1 is positive, this really makes physical sense because things are decaying away. If a1 is greater than zero, it's almost always unphysical because exponential growth can never be supported indefinitely. It might be a transient. It might be something financial, which you hope. Um, a2 equals zero is clearly a problem. But it's a problem because we solved an equation that doesn't really exist anymore. This gets rid of the d squared term. And then, of course, there's all the different cases that I mentioned very briefly based on the sign of this term. So I want you to go through those, look at them. We'll show you some plots. In a, in a different lecture, I use Mathematica, and this will be an exercise that you're given. But it's, this is the key thing I want you to think about, but I'm not going to spend much time on it in this lecture. It's really something you need to just contemplate. Any questions on that? Yes? The A1, they're both greater than zero for physical and unphysical. Oh, sorry. That's supposed to be a less than zero. Thank you. Because notice, if a1 is negative, the e to the minus minus makes it positive. Yeah. Good catch. <laughs>